Hello. Welcome to the Nintendo Power Retrospectives. I'm Count Zero, and I'm back after a long absence due to school. Well, we've come to the last issue of Nintendo Power's second year, with issue number 13 for May and June of 1990. Yeah, the strategy guide issues have been kind of throwing off the count, but hey, we've been away for a while, so let's just not worry about that and get on with the reviews. Our cover game for this issue is Super C. We are back to the dioramas, with the two protagonists of the game lurking in the foliage while a big, stompy robot passes by. In the letters column, we have a question about where all the money goes with the cost of video games. Well, I mean, you don't think software writes itself, do you? Our first strategy guide for this issue is for Final Fantasy. As one of the dedicated strategy guide issues is covering Final Fantasy, I'm going to hold off on covering this until then. Unfortunately, as far as the guide goes, unlike the last proper issue, we don't have any more art by Yoshitaka Amano. Instead, we have art by one of the more standard Nintendo Power artists, who, to his credit, does a good job of evoking Mobius with the art style here. Honestly, aside from Yoshitaka Amano, when I think of other artists who really encapsulate what I think of for Final Fantasy, the f artists who really come to mind are Mobius and to a certain degree, Hayao Miyazaki, whose art style is very similar to that of Mobius. So, yeah. Going for a Mobius-inspired art style works perfectly. Next up is Super C. We got a map of the first level in the preview earlier, so for this article, we're starting with level 2, which is the first commando-style level in the game. Level 3 returns us to our more traditional run, jump, and gun type of gameplay. And the guide also gives some information on stages 4 through 7. Gameplay-wise, Super C is more difficult than Contra. In fact, well, the fact that this game's version of the Konami code is nerfed in comparison to the original, specifically 10 lives per continue instead of the original 30, doesn't help. However, this game is basically more Contra, except just harder. That said, the game plays just as well as Contra, except, well, it's tougher. So, if you couldn't beat Contra without the code, keep that in mind, but if you considered Contra to be a challenge that you've conquered and you really want more of that, this is a good place to go for more of that style of gameplay. Next up is Dino Wars, a super robot action game with some outside-the-robot sequences as well. We get a rundown of the game's power-ups, and I'm finding it kind of notable that there's a Rocket Punch style attack on the list of power-ups. Actually, it was enough that it, it made me want to do some research to check on the Japanese version of the game to see if it was licensed on something. But no, this is an original property. There is no dino robot franchise that this game is based on. Not that I'm saying there isn't a dino robot franchise. I know about the Dinobots from Transformers and so forth and so on, and Zoids. Um, but this wasn't based on a Zoids game in Japan or anything like that. It's a completely original IP. Um at least from the evidence they have available. The game, the article gives us maps of the first six stages. Gameplay-wise, though, Dino Wars is an unplayable pile of garbage. The game has several major flaws. First, you only have one life, and unless you've got unlimited continues or are giving extremely regular checkpoints like with modern games, that's simply a no-no. This isn't an arcade game, you're playing it at home on your console, and you probably at the time paid the 1980s or 1990s equivalent of like 60 bucks or so to get a copy of this game. Or you spent the 1990s, late 80s equivalent of like 5, 10 bucks, whatever, to rent this for a weekend. So, you should be kind of getting your money's worth there. Second, the platforming is incredibly iffy. When you're jumping at moving platforms, your placement must be absolutely perfect, or else you will fall through the platform onto spikes or your death if there's nothing below. Third, um, the controls which you're using to do this platforming are also incredibly iffy, making it incredibly difficult to precisely make those jumps. The only really redeeming point of this game is that when you're in when you're not in the giant robot, you start out with a spread shot attack, which is something that most games make you have to hunt for. But, honestly, you shouldn't play this game. Next up, we have the winners of the Nintendo Power Awards, so let's get to the rundown. Mega Man 2 wins in the categories of Best Graphics and Sound and Best Play Control. 
I can't argue with these, as Mega Man 2 was my pick for graphics and sound, and the game controls like a dream. Ninja Gaiden wins for best challenge and best ending, which were two of my picks, so no complaints there. Link from Zelda 2 wins for best character. Now, this isn't as rage-inducing as Zelda 2 winning last year was, but I really think the game shouldn't have been eligible for this category, as the game was nominated for last year's awards and did very well there. It'd be like having the same movie nominated for two Oscars, two Academy Awards, uh, years in a row. It just doesn't seem right. Um, Tecmo Ball wins for Best Player vs. Player, which, again, I picked it to win there, so no complaints. And Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles wins for Best Theme Fun, and the Best Game ca uh, categories. And it's kind of a bit of a shame. Um, honestly, Ninja Gaiden had the better story, and one of the story was one of the things they weren't considering for this, so I really think Ninja Gaiden should have won there. And Tetris really is the game that has history on its side when it comes to best game. So I really think it deserved to have won there. In any case, um, with Howard and Nestor, the two are going inside Super Mario Bros. 3 to find themselves a warp whistle. However, Nestor doesn't trust Howard's advice, as per usual, and ends up getting bumped. And I don't mean the um, Hudson mascot character. Codename Viper is a game that I reviewed back when I was writing up issues of Nintendo Power on my blog, and it was one of my first video reviews, along with Corporate Triangle. Still, I'm going through one issue at a time, so it's time to revisit it. And, well, Codename Viper is a game that plays like Rolling Thunder, but with a War on Drugs storyline. Between this article and the poster, we get maps of every level in the game. Gameplay-wise, as I mentioned, Codename Viper plays almost exactly like Rolling Thunder. The environments are different, they're tro more tropical than Rolling Thunder's industrial environments, though we do get some industrial environments here too. Um, the jumps are a little more iffy, with some platforms having a smaller safe area to stand on than is actually drawn for them. The life bar for your character is also a little shorter than with Rolling Thunder. Um, additionally, enemies in this game have... well, we get enemies who can shoot on the diagonal when your player can't. And this is a kind of a pet peeve for me. I don't like it when, in a game, enemies can basically shoot in different directions than the player can. It, it feels like cheating on the part of the computer. If the enemies can shoot on the diagonal, there should be a way for players to shoot on the diagonal. Even if it requires a power-up to let you shoot on the diagonal, whether it's something like a spread shot or what have you. In any case, though, the gameplay is okay. I gave it a fairly favorable review when I reviewed it before, but I wouldn't describe it as anything special. If you're looking for, well, games to collect for purposes of good games to collect as opposed to going for a complete collection of everything, this wasn't exactly something I'd go out of my way to hunt for. But if I found it at the right price at a convention or whatever, sure, I might pick up a copy. Next up is Burai Fighter, which is a jetpack shooter that we previewed earlier. We get maps for stages 1, 2, and 4, with tips for 3, 5, and 7. Now, gameplay-wise, this is the first jetpack shoot 'em up I've reviewed thus far, and I have to say I'm not impressed. The controls themselves are okay, and the levels are decently designed, but my biggest issue with the game is with the hitbox. Now, I went into this a bit before, but if you're unfamiliar with shooters and game design terminology, hitbox is the area around your character or ship or whatever, the, the player sprite, that the game recognizes as being the player for purposes of bullet impacts and that sort of thing. Some games have big sprites with really tiny hitboxes, like some of the um, bullet hell shooters that you can get on like Xbox Live Arcade and that sort of thing. Other ones, the, the hitbox is just as big as the sprite, if not even a little larger. Um, well, with some of the jetpack shmups I've played in the past, not for review, but just in general, um, the game gave the player a hitbox that's considerably smaller than their sprite, to compensate for the fact that the dramatically larger sprite has less room to maneuver than a ship like the Big Viper does. This lets you get through con more confined portions of environments, and that sort of thing. Um, Burai Fighter doesn't do that, or at least it isn't consistent about it. Um, this isn't helped by the game using uh, checkpointing, like with R-Type, where 
When you die, you are sent back to the last checkpoint, rather as opposed to having you start back up again where you are, like with Life Force. Now this, combined with the uh, password I used in my gameplay footage, um, rather, that I would have used in the gameplay footage that I originally recorded, but I'm not using because I'm using gameplay footage from NESGuides.com, who are an awesome site, by the way. Um, you, you can brute force your way through this game. Um, if you use the password and abuse the checkpointing system. And I have no problem people brute forcing and save scumming and check and uh, password spoofing their way through a game. But that's not necessarily fun for me, and I care whether games are fun, and I just simply didn't find Beer Eye Fighter to be fun. In our top 30 this issue, we have the Back to the Future game somehow making the list. I assume this is due to the fact that the game isn't actually out yet, because um, doing the research kind of gave me the impression that it wasn't out at the time this issue of Nintendo Power came out. Again, release dates for this period are iffy because there were no hard and fast release dates for video games. But still, I got the hunch that most of the people who voted for this game hadn't actually played it and were assuming it was going to be awesome because Back to the Future, the movie, was awesome. Because, well, I've seen the review from the Angry Video Game Nerd, and this game was terrible. Hopefully I don't have to review it at any point in the future. Um, we'll see. We have some brief previews, um, with the games here ca that caught my attention being Adventures of Lolo 2, Tombs and Treasure, and Journey to Silius. In the Game Boy section, we actually have something close to feature articles for two games, specifically the Game Boy version of Batman and Gargoyle's Quest, which is a sort of platformer RPG hybrid that is spun off from Ghouls and Ghosts, or Ghosts and Goblins or whatever else you want to call that series. Gameplay-wise, I'd argue Batman for the NES was, with the exception of Batman's prolific number of guns, the best Batman simulator you could really ask for on a console until we got Arkham Asylum in the modern-slash-last generation? I'm not sure what terminology to use with the launch of the Xbox One and PS3. Anyway, Batman for the Game Boy, on the other hand, is an abysmal game. First off, the Sunsoft Sine Wave shot is back as one of your weapon upgrades, which is something that the NES version very wisely ditched. Because honestly, the Sunsoft Sine Wave shot is a useless weapon upgrade. In fact, it's almost a downgrade. Um, second, the platforming in this game is very imprecise and very floaty. And third, the environments are just dull to navigate. Um, even when the NES version was putting you through yet another variation on the industri industrial environments early on in the game, the levels looked interesting. These don't. This game just isn't fun. I recommend you avoid it. Gargoyle's Quest, on the other hand, is hard. Like, I can't beat the first level hard. But the reasons for this are kind of difficult to get into. The sprites of the game, the game are fairly large because they want you to give you nice large detailed sprites and interesting graphics to look at, which consequently gives this game a lot of character, which is good for a game, but this also means the perspective is zoomed in very tightly, which means that it's difficult to plan your jumps ahead, which means there's a lot of deaths due to not knowing what precisely waits off screen to insta-give you. This makes the gameplay very trial and error heavy, and honestly, trial and error gameplay is very high up there on my list of pet peeves. So I'm not going to recommend this game, but I'm not going to say it's bad yet. Now, this game was ported to the NES later on in the NES's life cycle, and that version, because graphically you could still have the same size sprites and same amount of character there while having the perspective that lets you plan ahead more, all of that could combine to lead to a much more pleasant and much more enjoyable experience than the portable version of this game. So. I'm going to hold up on passing judgment on Gargoyle's Quest as a whole until that version comes around. We then have a preview of Ninja God N2, which gets a strategy guide later on, so I'm going to focus on the game more there. Then there's also a preview of Star Tropics, which is Nintendo's just for the US semi Zelda styled game. We then have Golgo 13 in the Mafia Conspiracy, 
now featuring characters smoking in the art in the magazine. Which is kind of a wow moment, because nowadays, if you were making a magazine for the same demographic that Nintendo Power was marketed to back then, and had a character smoking, there would be a crap storm of epic proportions. Also, now the game has much more vibrant colors and environments than the last game, and driving stages, and I'm actually kind of interested in checking this game out, because it might fix a lot of the problems I had with the original GoGo 13. Um, SNK has a post-apocalyptic combination of Zelda and East coming out called Crystallis, and in the Counselor's Corner we have a whole bunch of questions for and about Battle of Olympus, which is good to know since that game's going to get covered in the year two best of the rest. In classified information, the password has been cracked for Mega Man 2 now as well, so we get full details on how to use this to get all, all your full energy tanks and all the weapons and so forth and so on. In video shorts, we have a look at WCW's licensed wrestling game, with, which comes not only with finishing moves, but also submissions as well, which is something that WWF uh, WrestleMania game was sorely lacking. In the NES Journal, some guys from Nintendo get to check out Boeing's flight simulators. Yeah, this is around the time when big, gyro-mounted computerized flight, similar, computerized flight simulators were a brand new thing. Also, Nintendo was doing some officially licensed comics to Valiant. But unfortunately, this means that the Legend of Zelda comic is going to be closer to the Well, excuse me, princess version than the version we got later for the official Link to the Past comic. Our celebrity profile this issue is for Willie Ames from the show Charles in Charge. Since this issue was published, uh, Ames has become a born-again Christian and is basically only doing projects related to that, which is the second guy we've come to this far in this magazine who's basically gone born again and only done Christian films. Uh, in Pack Watch, we have a look at Castlevania 3, which I'll talk about later when we get a full article about it. Due to the limited number of games this issue, particularly with much of the issue being taken up with the results of the Game of the Year polls, there's only one pick I can really go with this time, in terms of spaces for one pick. Particularly, there isn't that really that many two-player games available, so... I'm going with Super C for my pick of the issue, and honestly, Super C would probably work for both single-player single, single player or two-player, since much like Contra, it is a two-player game. Um, it's hard. I didn't like it because of its difficulty, but it's a tough-but-fair kind of difficulty. Um, the same way that Contra was had a tough-but-fair kind of difficulty level. I do miss the fact that the Konami code doesn't give you as much Hell, much any players as it did before, because I liked having the option where if I just want to just play through it and learn everything, I can just use the Konami code to learn where the enemies are and then go through again with the normal amount of players, but still, it works. Um, next time, though, we are going to do the best of the rest for Nintendo Power's second year. I'm not going to be going through and doing the point totals with the games this time. I'll just be going through. And, well, if you enjoyed this show, and you like to see more of them and stuff, give me a please subscribe to the channel, in terms of if you want to be notified when more are coming out, I should say. Subscribe to the channel, and you'll know when the next episode comes out, as well as when any of my, le any of my Let's Plays come out. And also, please give this video a thumbs up. Um... For that matter, if you look up in the links box, there is a tip jar. Feel free to leave a donation. Um, yes, these videos have ads, but if you've been following gaming news, you'll know that YouTube's copyright content ID policy stuff has been kind of been being a pain in the butt lately. So hey, donations help. They help keep the show running, and eventually they may help get me a gear upgrade so I can be recording this in a better camera and other similar stuff. So, in any case, I will see you next time.